Welcome to BioWorld and thank you for staying on with me, although I have been missing for quite some time. And I would also like to thank my subscribers for reminding me that these videos of mine are still relevant post-COVID. So in today's BioWorld episode, I'm going to talk about specialized animal cells. Let's look at the syllabus. The syllabus requires you to know about epithelial tissues, including the formation of the endocrine and exocrine glands. So let's remove his t-shirt. What we see here is the epithelial tissue. Now let's go to microscope level to see what cells make up the epithelial tissue. This is a microscope image of the epithelial tissue. You can notice that the cells in the epithelial tissues look quite different. To make it easier for you to follow, I'm going to use simple diagrams to introduce the many different types of cells that make up epithelial tissues. All epithelial tissues sit on a basement membrane. This membrane is actually a layer of collagen proteins. The cells can either be single layered or they can carry out active mitosis to become multilayered. All these cells stick together in the presence of a substance called the hyaluronic acid. It is important to note that the epithelial tissues do not have blood vessels. This is because the blood vessels are below the basement membrane. However, this layer of tissue still receives oxygen and nutrient with the help of the lymphatic vessels. Now, we'll familiarize with the specific epithelial cells that make up the epithelium tissue. The cells include squamous epithelium, cuboidal epithelium, and columnar epithelium. You can note that the squamous epithelial cells are actually quite flattened, except for the center, because it needs to provide space for the nucleus. Epithelial tissues with squamous epithelium are suitable for exchange of substances because this shape provides larger surface area. The cuboidal epithelium, which is cube in shape, and the columnar epithelium, which is elongated, are suitable for epithelial surfaces that require protection. Some cuboidal and columnar epithelial cells can also develop cilia on their surface. The presence of the cilia make them into ciliated cuboidal epithelium or ciliated columnar epithelium. Epithelium tissues with ciliated cells are suited for movement of substances. The squamous, the cuboidal and the columnar epithelial cells that are single layered are called simple epithelium. There are some organs that require multi-layered epithelial cells. So those layers that are multi-layered are called compound epithelium or more specifically stratified epithelial tissue. So these here are called stratified squamous epithelial tissue stratified cuboidal epithelial tissue, and stratified columnar epithelial tissue. Under the simple epithelial tissues, there is also a category called pseudo-stratified. The word pseudo means false. Stratified means multilayered. So pseudo-stratified epithelial tissues are actually simple because they are made up of a single layer. However, 
under a microscope, they give an impression as if they were multilayered just because the nucleus are positioned quite randomly. So, for example, in this diagram of mine, it can give an appearance that there are actually three layers of cells, although they are all actually positioned on the same basement membrane. Under the compound epithelial tissues, we also have one other category called transitional epithelium. Transitional epithelial cells look very much like stratified epithelium, but transitional epithelium can change their shape, whereby they can actually be compressed. And when necessary, they can bounce back to normal. Epithelial tissues can be quite complex because they are a mix of the different types of cells mentioned earlier. However, I will use three systems in the human body to help explain the distribution of these cells, starting with the respiratory system. In the trachea, you will find pseudostratified epithelial tissues. Remember, pseudostratified tissues are actually simple epithelium. Next, we move down to the bronchus. In the bronchus wall, you will find ciliated epithelial cells. It can either be cuboidal ciliated epithelium or columnar ciliated epithelial cells. Either way, it is the cilia that is of importance because the cilia will help sweep away the dust that we inhale. At the ending of the respiratory system, we have the alveolus, and in the alveolus, you will find the squamous epithelial tissue. Squamous epithelial tissues will increase the surface area, enabling more efficient gaseous exchange. Now let's move on to the digestive system. In the stomach wall, you will find stratified columnar epithelial cells. These cells are important for the stomach wall because the stomach secretes acid, which can erode the stomach wall. Stratified columnar epithelial cells make the stomach wall thick and able to minimize the effect of acid erosion. At the ileum, we will find columnar epithelial cells. These columnar epithelial cells can modify to form microvilli that will increase surface area to promote absorption of nutrients. Next, we look at the urinary system. The bladder of the urinary system is made up of transitional epithelial tissue. When the bladder is empty, the cells in the transitional epithelial tissue will be at normal size. But as urine accumulates in the kidney, transitional epithelial cells will begin to flatten out so that there is more room to collect the urine. And once the urine is expelled and the bladder is empty once more, the transitional epithelial cells will return to normal. Finally, we look at the structure of the nephron in the kidney. Nephron has long tubules, and these tubule walls are made up of cuboidal epithelial cells. So this sums up some examples of the distribution of epithelial cells. Now we'll talk about the final type of epithelial tissue known as the glandular epithelium. The glandular epithelium forms when the epithelium tissue does mitosis, but the new cells, instead of developing upwards, begin to develop downwards. One of two events may occur. The first event would be that these group of cells will break free from the main epithelial layer and become trapped in the blood capillaries located below the basement membrane. When this occurs, 
and endocrine gland is formed. The second event that may occur is that the group of cells may rearrange themselves so that a channel or a duct develops. Now this structure is an exocrine gland. If you observe carefully, both the cells in the endocrine gland as well as the exocrine gland have modified a little into what is known as the goblet cell. These goblet cells are able to secrete substances such as sweat if it is located at the skin or milk if the goblet cells are located in the mammary gland of the female, mucus if the goblet cell is located in the nasal cavity, or even saliva if the goblet cell is located in the salivary gland. Now let's take the example of an endocrine gland. Let's say this is a pituitary gland located in our brain. So the goblet cells will synthesize hormones such as growth hormone, which will then be transported by blood to the rest of our body for growth to occur. Or in the case of an exocrine gland, let's say this is a salivary gland. Therefore, the goblet cells will not only synthesize and secrete saliva, but be able to also synthesize enzymes such as amylase. The amylase then is transported through the salivary duct to the surface of our mouth where the enzyme will then break down the starch into maltose. So in conclusion, we have completed today's discussion on epithelial tissues as well as the formation of endocrine and exocrine glands. See you soon. Bye-bye.